Here's a D&D 5e monster stat block for a goblin boss. But here's the same monster stat block from Shadow Dark RPG, fairly compatible with 5e. And here it is again in the free sample of MCDM's Flea Mortals, fully compatible with 5e. One creature, three very different stat blocks, but all have the same goal of describing a monster that's fun for your RPG player characters to face in battle. Different approaches, one goal. That makes this supposed stat block problem a fascinating subject for game masters because it's emblematic of a much larger idea of how you and I each enjoy our role-playing games. So we're going to break down this D&D stat block dilemma because I'm Bob, this is where we learn how to have more fun playing RPGs together, and while problem works better on a YouTube thumbnail, I'm using the word dilemma intentionally. This is about a difficult choice made by game designers. And in the simplest of terms, it is a choice between rulings and rules. Look at this D&D version again. Goblin boss. Small humanoid, goblinoid, neutral, evil. Now, I see three rules on display right here, and depending on your interpretation, there might be more or fewer, but in my opinion, only two of these rules are actually important for 5e gameplay. Let's see if we're on the same page. We got small, the creature size, humanoid, the creature type, and goblinoid, the subtype. But as far as I know, the subtype of a monster has zero impact on how spells, items, or other 5e features interact with this creature, at least specifically goblinoid. And its alignment definitely has no effect in 5e, which is why I didn't even include it as a rule. On the other hand, Humanoid is definitely important for how a lot of 5e spells work, and small won't come into play often, but since other sizes like large and huge are more consequential in 5e, I'm on the fence about that one. So that mini thought experiment was about what rules are necessary on a stat block, what rules are not necessary on a stat block, and what rules could be on it or could be left up to the game master as a ruling, a decision made by the referee not by the designers. Quick example, creature size categories aren't really a thing in Shadow Dark as far as I know, yet as a game master, I would totally make the ruling that it's easier to carry or drag around a small creature than a big creature. Similar to how it works in 5e, but without the stat block or the game as a whole needing to tell me that. It's just intuitive. Remember, I'm framing this around playing for fun rather than playing correctly. And for many folks, that Venn diagram is a circle, and that's cool. But I imagine that many of those folks are already keenly aware of which rules feel necessary on a stat block and which ones don't. So as we get deeper into this thought experiment, be sure to leave your thoughts down in the comments because I'm going to be taking note of how this turns out for my own publications on Patreon and possibly even influencing my awesome book that's going to be on Kickstarter later this spring. Yeah, keep your eyes open for real announcements about that coming soon. Anyway, let's zoom out for a minute. Everything highlighted green on this D&D Goblin Boss is a game rule, but everything crossed out doesn't belong on a stat block, in my opinion. If we do the same thing for the Shadow Dark version, we get a very dense chunk of rules, but still, some parts of it may or may not be required to have fun. In fact, I think we're missing a little something on this particular stat block, even though all Shattered Arc monsters do come with a handy, wonderful, concise description for the monster's appearance. A scarred goblin with knotted muscles and a crown of iron. And if you wish your 5e monster stat blocks came with professionally written descriptions, look no further than this video's awesome sponsor, Describe. And what's this? An entire suite of music, ambience, and sound effects just from searching the word goblin? Yeah. Which describes new and improved audio platform, Opus Opus. You can easily search, save, and share immersive audio tracks. I've tested it myself. Invite, copy that link, send it to your friends, and just like that, you have added a new dimension to your role-playing game experience. And you, who dared to watch this entire segment, are lucky because you know that Code B.O.B. currently grants you a free 30-day trial of any subscription tier on Describe. So right after this video, go check it out through the link below.
But now we'll jump into the real meat of this dilemma, the monster's combat actions. Back to the D&D Goblin boss. Scimitar, melee weapon attack, plus four to hit, reach five feet, one target, hit, five, 1d6 plus two, slashing damage. So the good thing about this degree of detail in rules on a stat block is that a brand new game master can read this line of text and I think gain a pretty solid grasp of how to use this feature in combat without even reading the combat rules of the game. Uh, scimitar, that's like a curved sword, right? Oh yeah, melee weapon, duh. And I know I roll a d20 to hit because that's like the main thing, so plus four to hit must be added to that. Uh, reach five feet, sure. And I guess I can only attack one target at a time. And if the hit succeeds, it deals five slashing damage. So, yeah, it's a sword. Uh, or I guess I could roll damage instead, 1d6 plus two. Cool. I think that makes sense, but I can't be sure without polling a bunch of people who have never played a role-playing game. And I'm not going to do that, at least in this video, but I stand by the idea that this text is fairly self-explanatory. Alternatively, Shadow Dark. Attack, 1. Spear, close slash near, plus 3, 1d6. If you're a brand new game master, I think this would be harder to understand, but if you've ever even played D&D 5e, I think it's mostly clear. ATK one spear, okay, that's gotta be one spear attack, close slash near. Well, it looks like a 5e weapon range. Oh, and it's a, it's a spear, so I could probably use it melee and throw it close range, whatever that means, or throw it near range with disadvantage. And yeah, plus three to hit, 1d6 damage. Seems kind of low, but cool. And that would be almost entirely correct. The only clarification would be that close slash near is a range but the word close in Shadow Dark means melee, or five feet, and near means 30 feet. So you can use this spear as a melee weapon or a ranged weapon by throwing it 30 feet. Maybe not 100% intuitive coming directly from 5e, but now you get it, and all it took was someone explaining it once. Or of course, reading the weapon and distance rules yourself, which by the way, are on the opening spread of the book. Very nice. And now this rule for a weapon is just as clear as this rule for a weapon, but the second one is three times as long because it contains a ton of default combat rules from other sections of the book. Of course, the scimitar is a melee weapon attack. Of course, that plus four bonus is two hit. For reach, we already know it's a melee weapon, and we know from the rules that melee by default means five feet, and every single weapon can only attack one target why do they say that every time? And then we just need the damage, and maybe the type. And to be fair, we could even reduce the Shadow Dark attack down to something like this. One Spear TH plus three, one D6. Because TH is the abbreviation that Shadow Dark already uses for the throne property on weapons, which by default means 30 feet. Or if we wanted to get absolutely minimal, we could assume that game masters have also memorized the properties and damage dice of a spear or a scimitar and drop those too. But that's too minimal, even for my taste. Like, I will never forget that a scimitar is a melee weapon that hits one target within five feet because all of that information is intuitive and or redundant with the default rules of combat and weapons, but I probably will forget its damage dice. So let's revisit the thesis here. As a game master, the point of a stat block is to provide you with only the information that you might reasonably need to reference during combat, because that's when it matters to quickly execute your turn and you don't want to be pausing to flip through the book. But wait, our ultimate purpose, we must bring or maintain the fun at our table. And I don't know about you, but scimitar plus four, 1d6 plus two doesn't sound very fun. This is where the Game Master comes in with creative ideas for behaving as that monster and hopefully using the scene itself to provide other fun interactions. However, if we wanted our monsters to be fun and interesting, even on an entirely featureless plane, this is where we would want monsters from Flea Mortals. This goblin boss is pretty freaking cool even in the vacuum of space, assuming it's got a couple other goblins to boss around. But wow! Reading one stat block shouldn't take more than 30 seconds. We've got a combat to run here. So let's cut this thing down and see what we get. 
First, to be fair, a lot of this information is carried over from the standard format of D&D &D stat blocks, and therefore, it might only be here because MCDM wanted to follow that standard. But even some of their cool additions could be just as clear with fewer words, in my opinion. You be the judge. Goblin boss. Small, humanoid, goblin, any alignment. Like I hinted at earlier, the creature size, small, is almost never relevant because even player characters in 5e can be small with almost no change to how they function. So if it were huge or tiny, maybe I'd keep it, but not small. We already said humanoid is very important, but goblinoid is not, and if the monster can be any alignment, I think we could just leave that space blank. CR2, support, 450 XP. You already know CR is not super useful compared to basics like HP, AC, and damage, then support is one of these 4th edition style terms that MCDM is bringing back to further organize monsters, but as someone who never used those terms before, I don't feel like I need it now, and I know from numerous polls that only about 15% of GMs use XP, and I'm not one of them, so this whole little section is out for me. Next, I think that if a game invents an acronym, the game should also use that acronym. So instead of spelling out armor class, we'll go with AC17. And as for listing specific armor types, this info is really handy for doing monster math, but not necessary for combat until the PCs are looting the body. So I would move this to the very bottom. Also, HP36 could just be 30 or 40, maybe 35, but there's no reason not to round HP. And I don't know about you, but I have never rolled for a monster's hit points when a flat number was provided. Speed 30 feet is the default speed for every creature in the game, and every GM who has played or read the rules already knows that. So we can keep the special movement, but I would also bump this climb up to 30 feet, because right now it's only one square faster than a normal creature, which to me feels like having 36 HP instead of 35. Stats. Okay, please validate me in the comments when I say that no GM in their right mind has ever used the full ability score of a monster for anything. The modifiers, yes, but the score, like have you ever once needed to know that a monster had 12 wisdom? I don't buy it. But now, invalidate me in the comments when I say that the modifiers aren't that useful either, particularly if the stat block lists out its saves and skills and proficiency bonus right in the next section. But yeah, if we have the space, then having this math already done for us is helpful. Dark vision, 60 feet though? Just like speed, 30 feet? That's the default distance and we all know it, so I think we can just say dark vision. Even though that too is practically a default in 5e, am I right? Passive perception is very helpful because I don't like rolling perception checks against my PCs, and languages definitely feels like it belongs in a lore section, not a combat stat block. But okay, here's where we can really just decimate this word count. Crafty. The boss doesn't provoke opportunity attacks when they move out of an enemy's reach. I think that second part is 100% redundant because as far as I know, moving out of an enemy's reach is the only way to provoke an opportunity attack. Also, why do stat block features have names if the definition is listed right here? This could just say, never provokes opportunity attacks, and it would deliver the same information faster with just as much clarity, assuming the GM knows what an opportunity attack is from the rest of the rules. Multi-attack. The boss makes two short sword or short bow attacks, they can use command in place of one attack. This is where we can steal from Shadow Dark again. Instead of spelling out multi-attack and the short sword attack and the short bow attack all separately, we could use something like two short sword or two short bow. AD slash 320 plus five, 1D6 plus three piercing. Or one weapon and one command. That covers it. Command. The boss chooses one ally they can see within 30 feet of them. If the target can hear the boss, the target can use their reaction to move up to their speed or make one weapon attack. Yes, this is how things are worded in 5e, but I think this wording of the rule disallows intuitive rulings. 
For example, this goblin boss cannot shout a command to a goblin that's just out of their view, right around a corner, right behind a closed door, or if this boss is blinded for some reason. But I feel the boss should totally be able to command, hey Boblin, move to me, even if they can't see Boblin. Likewise, if Boblin is deafened or if the boss merely signals at an enemy creature, by this wording, Boblin doesn't understand that that means to attack the enemy creature. Even the 30 foot range feels kind of unnecessary for how far away a goblin boss can shout or signal. To reiterate, I'm sure they have good reasons for spelling this out, but in my view of this particular feature, by attempting to enforce rules about how communication works, they kind of spoiled some intuitive rulings about how communication works. And this is exactly the kind of stuff that players end up arguing about, where it could just be something like, command one ally to move or attack. Yeah, I also dropped that it costs a reaction because I don't think it's a big deal if Boblin also gets to make an opportunity attack in the same round, mm. and selfishly so, because I don't even use his opportunity attacks at my table anymore, and total sidebar, but yes, even my rogue players enjoy the game without opportunity attacks. And you know what? We've done it. With just that one cool move, inspired by MCDM's Goblin Boss, but pared down, like the minimalism of Shadow Dark. I think we got a fun monster stat block that we can read and understand in about 30 seconds, containing all the info we might reasonably need and nothing we don't. So I'll tinker with this a bit and make sure it's a legally distinct 5e creature, then pop it up on my Patreon with a regular goblin stat block for your free download linked in the description. If you found this video helpful, remember to give it a like and consider subscribing or even joining Patreon to support me directly, but thank you for your support and keep building.